So what we're going to be looking at today is um, incorporating some cyber threat intelligence and Atomic Red Team really to look at, at two core security operations and then response. So we figure, hey, how do we verify that we can actually see or detect threat actor behaviors and TTPs, and how do we respond to them? As I said, my name is uh, Jerry Johansson. I'm a pr principal security solutions specialist here at uh, Red Canary, uh, where I work uh, developing detection and response solutions. Uh, been in the industry about 14, 15 years now uh, with some uh, experience in government and law enforcement. And uh, I am a uh, Midwesterner located in Rapid City, South Dakota. So what are we going to talk about? Really what's important right now? is the what and why of emulation. This is kind of a, an interesting concept, and if you're, if you're new to this or, or maybe you're more experienced you know, on the penetration testing side or the red teaming side, uh, this may be uh, a, a relatively new concept when we're talking, doing this at the atomic level. And the tool that we're going to uh, leverage for this is Atomic Red Team. This is an open source project uh, via Red Canary uh, that mimics or emulates those threat actor TTPs that we're actually going to look at. We're going to look at breaking down emulation types specifically around ransomware. Obviously, ransomware is a huge threat. We see uh, the speed of threat actors, the, the variety of techniques and tactics that they and tools that they deploy. So we're going to look at breaking out four emulation types to get started. We'll actually look at how we're going to build emulations. How do we put these together? Is there a construct that we can do uh, without a lot of uh, overhead, without the need to engage various teams, without a lot of resources? And the answer, short answer is yes. Short answer is yes with a but. Uh, there is some work that needs to be done, but we're going to work through how to build those emulations. And then we're going to demo some of those emulation plans and really kind of look at not just using this is a validation tool for detection, but also really giving both sides of an attack to various teams. Oftentimes we only see if we're looking at digital evidence related to a security breach or a ransomware attack, we get to see only one side. One of the things that we're gonna look at when we're demoing is you get to see both sides of the Atomic Red Team test showing what the threat actor is going to do, and then what does it look like from our vantage point? So when we're talking about ransomware, what are we really specifically talking about in terms of emulating? So we want to use their tactics, techniques, and procedures to mimic what they're using, what the threat actor, how they're operating in the environment. We're going to run simulated attacks, either one at a time or in succession. And then again, we're hitting that detection and response action validation. But when we're talking about ransomware, the major differentiator between saying a general threat emulation or we are using a generic threat model is we are going to tie what we know about ransomware threat actors from publicly available sources of information or threat intelligence, or even maybe potentially you have a close source of threat intelligence. So that is really the, the key differentiator from a just a general emulation to, hey, let's focus on what we're seeing from a ransomware. So we want to mimic those techniques. This is really going to align our detection controls and our response actions to meet that threat and to be very, very specific with what we're doing there. So why? Why are we emulating? Well, as I, as I said, we get a look at both attack and detection. Oftentimes it's very difficult, as I said, to get both sides of the, the, uh, the attack sequence. Meaning, what does a threat actor see, or what does a threat actor do from, say, the command line? And then what does that command line execution look like in our detective controls? Whether that's sending log files to an event management system, or an EDR, or whatever we're using from a detective control, we get both sides of this. This is what we're seeing. Again, 
of validating detection rules. This is one of the core functions of Atomic Red Team is the ability to run a specific test and answer a very central question, which is, can we detect this? So that is one of the other key aspects of this. Some things that we may not be able to detect, others we should be able to detect. We should have a capability to say, this is bad, this is in and of itself malicious, and you need to pay attention to it. Here's a major challenge that we're also going to look at overcoming with those, is incident response team, in terms of training, in terms of, of their ability to identify and respond to these things, uh, they need realistic data to analyze and pivot off of. It's one thing to say, grab some, some log files uh, as a training tool, but it loses its efficacy very quickly. And it's also maybe one or two dimensional, meaning it only gives us a few different aspects of a threat that we can work through. So we're actually gonna look at, hey, how can we run some tests to give our IR teams realistic data so that they can actually go through log files, potentially going through artifacts associated with execution or artifacts associated with DNS queries. All of that comes into play here because we are able to mimic those threats and actually give them some realistic data to, to move through. One of the other things about emulation aspects is flexibility. If you think about uh, trying to engage in that last bullet point, a penetration testing team, we're kind of bound by contractual obligations. We're bound by when they can actually run the tests. And it's often very, very long and prolonged in maybe two, three weeks of penetration testing or a full team, a full red team exercise. It's very difficult for us to run, say, a single test in 10, 15 minutes or to say, hey, over the next four hours, we're going to run a series of tests. But that flexibility with using something like Atomic Red Team, that gives us that ability versus, hey, we have to wait for our, our yearly penetration test or we have to wait for uh, the red team to execute something. So we're going to look at, hey, how is this flexible and how can we use it as, as kind of a normal operation? And as a caveat, that flexibility allows you to do these tests once a day, once a, once a, once a quarter, once a week, however you want to, to uh, use it, but it does allow you to run tests concurrently throughout the year as well. So Atomic Red Team. Atomic Red Team, as I said, is an open source tool um, provided by Red Canary. And uh, essentially it is a library of tests that are aligned, mapped, however you wanna put it, but aligned to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. It simulates this adversarial activity, meaning you can go in and grab a specific technique and it's going to simulate that adversarial activity. You see this manually, and we're going to look at running running Atomic Red Team manually today, but you also see it in frameworks such as Caldera, MITRE Caldera, which can be used for, for maybe much more robust testing and validation. The key takeaway here is because it's mapped to the MITRE ATT&CK framework, we have the ability to really align our Atomic Red Team testing with what's going on macro level from a cyber threat intelligence perspective. We're going to actually look at how going through specific reports that are aligned with the MITRE ATT&CK framework lend itself to extracting and being able to run these tests uh, in a testing environment. To install, uh, there's complete instructions on atomicredteam.io and on our GitHub on how to actually install and run these tests. But essentially what you have uh, are a few different types of, of uh, tools that are associated with Atomic Red Team. At the core of this is the Atomic Red Team is the library of tests. This is all of the tests that are basically built out by the community, by, by people uh, all over the uh, cybersecurity space. And these are essentially the tests that are validating uh, those visibility for detective controls. 
These can be run at command line. Some are PowerShell, some are command line. In the middle here, we have Invoke Atomic. And essentially, this is a execution framework. This allows us to script and more readily execute some of those techniques. This is, again, a PowerShell execution framework. You can go to the GitHub and install Invoke Atomic. And it allows you to not only run tests, but clean up after tests. One of the, one of the, uh, one of the, the factors with its running Atomic Red Team is sometimes you're actually pulling down some rather nasty stuff. For example, if we're testing Mimi Cats, for example, we'll actually pull down a uh, copy of Mimi Cats. And if we don't have Microsoft Defender for Endpoint or we don't have an EDR tool running, it very well may dump that on there. You also have registry rights, WMI event consumers, all sorts of stuff that's going to be impacting the uh, the operating system that you're running this on. So there is a cleanup feature with the Invoke Atomic. Another option is the Atomic Test Harness. This is uh, another uh, ver testing variation that involves the uh, attack techniques that you select. So the best way to put it from kind of a general guidance is the Atomic Red Team, those are those tests and they're, they're perfectly usable, but using something like Invoke or Atomic Test Harness allows you a little bit more, more functionality. And in our case, when we look at building emulation scripts, Invoke Atomic really does make it very easy to create a, a uh, sophisticated Atomic Red Team script that incorporates multiple techniques across a variety of tactics uh, without the need for a lot of cutting and pasting in terms of going out, grabbing the command line or the PowerShell script. It makes it a lot easier for us to, to put these together into a functional tool. So that's getting uh, install, uh, installing Atomic Red Team. Uh, we're going to look at four emulation types, uh, and we, we are really going to break these down that, that we can actually use for our test. So, for example, we're going to look at a technique, a single technique. So this may be um, OS credential dumping or something of that nature, a single technique. Really good for detection validation, specifically if you have use cases that you're really concerned on. So you have that single technique, and this can just be run within PowerShell to say, hey, I just want to run this single technique using Invoke Atomic in PowerShell and uh, execute it and see what happens. Here's where we start to apply a lot of this to ransomware. Threat. Here's where we're going to focus on a commonly encountered threat that we might see it in, uh, in the overall threat landscape, but specifically in ransomware. So Raspberry Robin, for example, could be a threat that we want to validate our detection and response against. So in this case, what we would do is grab a few of the techniques that are associated with Raspberry Robin, match them with the, uh, the Atomic Red Team tests, place them in a, in a PowerShell script, and fire them off. So we're getting multiple tests within, say, a minute or two to really kind of validate, again, that detection and response capability. Stage is another key aspect in terms of emulation, is looking at this from maybe a cyber attack kill chain or just a general stage where you have pre-execution or pre-exploitation and then we're looking at maybe post-exploitation where we're concerned about what would behaviors that ransomware threat actors use in an attack, very much like they may download Sharphound or they may run specific Windows commands and use specific Windows tools to map out an Active Directory environment. So again, what does that look like? What are we, what are we going to see if we were run tools like that? And then finally, maybe we look at a threat actor. Stage and threat actor are very similar in that stage is really looking at maybe a handful, you know, 10, 12 different types of, of techniques that are run that are associated with post exploitation that we see across a lot of different ransomware threat actors. But we also have threat actors specific like Akira, which may be specific post exploitations fit in there 
but we're going to put those within the overall context of the TTPs that Acura has been identified as using. So, a little bit more detail is again, focus on a single technique. So for example, in this case, we'll be looking at doing a demo around ingress tool transfer. Good starting point is high volume techniques from threat intelligence. For example, the Red Canary Threat Detection Report breaks down. These are the top 10 techniques. These are the top 10 threats. This is really good if you are not familiar with using Atomic Red Team too much. Is pick a single technique out from a threat intelligence source or something that you've identified and then fire it off. As I said, single techniques are really good for detection validation. Can we detect this technique? You may ask yourself, can we detect what we, you also may say, are we even able to? There are some techniques that if they're using Windows binaries are, are legitimate tools, but you may not have the visibility into their use. Artifact extraction and analysis. Can we find indicators from these artifacts? We'll demo that as to actually what that looks like. And here's one of the other things to do is incorporate these into response drills. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. From a threat perspective, again, taking Raspberry Robin, extracting those TTPs, and then we are going to stri uh, start getting together an emulation plan that incorporates these tests. This is a very simple tax document run by PowerShell. So don't think that this has to be uh, several several hundred lines of code. It's a, As you're going to see, it's fairly straightforward. Extract these, place them in a sequence, and then fire them off running PowerShell. Hitting that detection val uh, visibility, all right? Here's the other thing is looking for potential evidence sources for specific techniques. For example, if you are concerned about Raspberry Robin or you're concerned about any type of, of threat, what does it look like from an execution perspective? What does it look like? Is Does it make any type of uh, registry modifications or writes? Or do we have to do some analysis there? Does it use anything to do with WMI event consumers? And again, we can put these into that detection and response drill. Stage, uh, this is again, very flexible. So post-exploitation really is, is a broad concept for a lot of different aspects of ransomware threat actor behaviors. But let's say we are going to pull in defense evasion where we want to disable defensive controls. All right. This is again put into that PowerShell script that allows us to execute these. Here's the big one that this does for you is really focusing on post exploitation and then focusing on defense evasion or maybe post exploitation and reconnaissance is you're really getting that visibility. Think back to getting both sides of, of an attack and an understanding of what that looks like. So we're getting that type of visibility and we may not be able to pick up on three or four of these, but there is maybe a whole host of post exploitation. Something as simple as a threat actor running the whoami.exe or net.exe. That's that kind of visibility to say, hey, those are kind of commands we don't normally see. So maybe that's something that we can pivot off of. Uh, that is going to at least point us into some post-exploitation or some reconnaissance. Even as something as, as simple as getting Windows Defender logs that show, hey, somebody's tried to disable Windows Defender, that gets into that defense evasion, something to be uh, pivoting off of and really much more indicative than a generalized uh, detection rule. One of the things I like to do too is Think about incorporating some of this into tabletop or simulation exercises, right? Is a good way to say, here's, here's a detection for disabling Windows Defender. What are your next actions? What are you going to do in reference to this situation? Is this an incident or do you do some more investigation? What's your next step? So it actually gives you some actionable data that people can look at, your team can look at to say, yeah, that's bad. And, and we need to follow up on that.
And then finally, the threat actor. Um, this is a complete picture of what a threat actor is going to do as best as we can. Obviously, we can't marry it up 100%. Nobody wants to, to encrypt their own environment. But there's a lot of TTPs that we can incorporate building out a, a, an emulation script that allows us to really see what a cure looks like from a detection and response perspective. Again, this is really good for building out realistic scenarios for exercises to really getting some, some key data points that we can start to look at. In terms of complexity, and, and as we're going to see, the complexity is, is, when I say complexity, it's relative. It's not necessarily uh, a highly complex multi-stage penetration test. Obviously, we can't go 100%, incorporate many threats, many techniques, uh, but it does give us a little bit more complexity in terms of, of what we're working with. It also marries up that catastrophic impact. It is much more aligned with getting to that catastrophic impact, meaning we are able to get a better complete picture of what a threat actor could do before we get into some, some uh, serious impact. But we may say focus on individual techniques and threats uh, in terms of less complexity to really focus on, on say, initial access or, or other less uh, catastrophic areas. As an overall guidance, uh, if you've not played with this or you've played with it a little bit in terms of atomic road team and testing, uh, you know, start with single technique and maybe threats and then build, build that complexity in later. Uh, but again, that flexibility is key here. So let's go through a process very, very simply to uh, extract some TTPs. Uh, and build an emulation script. So grab some threat intelligence, doesn't matter where. Uh, well, I should say caveat, it shouldn't just be, you know, uh, any old threat intelligence that you haven't verified, but look at, hey, specifically, let's grab, go up to the uh, CISA advisory, or I hate to say it again, the, you know, I, is the uh, atomic red team threat detection report. Look for the MITRE attack tactics and techniques. And when we demo a cure a little bit later, I'll show you a, the, the mass amount there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to just do some keyword searches in, in atomicredteam.io to find those matching techniques. And then we're going to build a very, very simple PowerShell script. So here we go through and inside that report, we find OS credential dumping. So we see, hey, we see the use of, of Mimikatz and other tools to dump credentials. Let's look very specifically and say, hey, what we're seeing is, um, you know, that, that T1003.001, that's what we're going to go ahead and look for. So we pivot from this, which is coming off of our Akira ransomware PDF document that we got from CISA, and we see something that we that piece our curiosity to say, hey, we want to include that. We want to make sure that this is a, a, what I would say is a, a high risk, high impact uh, occurrence that we need to really either validate, we can detect it, stop it, prevent it, and maybe respond to it. So a quick search through uh, atomic red team dot, dot, dot io under credential access shows us we have a test. And in this case, it's it's the atomic test number 10, and that's going to be PowerShell Mimikatz. So here we have basically Mimikatz being downloaded via PowerShell. And then this is the actual syntax of the Atomic Red Team, test. So we have in invoke atomic test. We have the, the MITRE attack technique, and then the test numbers. And then in this case, for each of these as a general practice, I make sure that any prerequisites are met before the test actually runs. So you'll see in this case, you've got one line that's dash get prereqs. And this is just telling Invoke Atomic, hey, if there's any prereqs identified, maybe it needs something specific on disk, it'll go out and satisfy those. If it doesn't, it says, oh, prereqs are met, I'm gonna go run into the test. So you'll see as we start to look at the emulation scripts, this is what we end up having here. 
So what ends up happening is you start to look at this as a basic text document. So here we have a number of different tests that a curie uses, and we have the Invoke Atomic, the prereqs, everything defined. So we're gonna go ahead and, and I'm gonna just demonstrate real quick a few of these and then wrap up and, and have plenty of time for questions. So. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Hold on, I got you. I got you, Jerry. Hold yeah, on. is it? Okay, yeah. Adam, tell me here. <laughs> Forgive us one second while we get it. Okay, so here we have ing in the ingress tool transfer single technique. We're going to go ahead and, and run this. What this is going to do is potentially show us. Uh, what we can actually do to detect bits admin, where bits admin is actually going out and downloading a secondary payload. This is directly from the, the threat detection report. So as you see, I've got my power, uh, PowerShell, uh, PowerShell prompt up, my window up, I run the test, and I start working through, executing the test, and then pivot over into something like Splunk and say, hey, can I see this? Can, is this something that I would see? Now, you may have to have tools like System Monitor logging this or other, uh, other logging sources pulling into, but really what we're getting is that visibility into a single technique. So as you, as you see, we're validating that detection mechanism and via that single test that we see fairly commonly used, but it provides us something to actually say, hey, we can see this. And this may be something that you want to hit on in your environment. It says we don't use this tool to download software. It shouldn't be run in our environment. So that's a single technique. As we start to go through, we're going to go ahead and look at uh, the threat. And in this case, uh, again, you're going to see a constant theme and you're seeing the workflow start to build out here. And the workflow uh, really functions on uh, pulling in that threat intelligence and, and making, it, making it useful for us in this regard. So here we've got a blog post on Raspberry Robin and just a quick cursory examination of the blog post. And as an aside here at Red Canary, a lot of the blog posts specifically around threats and tools, you're going to see the actual TTT, TTPs uh, within there. Here's just notepad.exe with the emulation script. These are the techniques that we pulled out from the blog post, put the syntax in into the script and saved it. Fairly straightforward process, but the, the major takeaway is, again, that flexibility of scaling back and forth what techniques you want to put in to the actual script. And then it's as simple as just pointing PowerShell at your script and running it. So here we're going to see it go ahead and execute those tests in sequence. And then in this case, we're looking at an EDR, uh, WAZA is our stand-in for an EDR tool. So what we want to see is, hey, can we detect any of these behaviors that we see with Raspberry Robin? So in, these, in this case, we may be having something that we can pivot off of. A really good test for your team is to say, hey, if you saw this, you saw this, what is your next step? You know, again, those data points. Threats, again, building those out, very straightforward workflow. All that we're going to do is really get a little bit more complexity. We're going to kind of work uh, through threat, and then we're going to go into the threat actor. So these are very similar. With a threat, we're really concerned about maybe uh, specific techniques uh, associated with a threat. So think tool, think uh, uh, a sequence like Raspberry Robin, and then threat actor. Threat actor, we're, we're going to incorporate a lot of the, the exploitation and post-exploitation TTPs 
and really build that out so that you can see that. So in this case, what you're going to see is going from that building the emulation script, running it, pivoting off a of detection, and, and a lot more of the response action. So in this case, as we start to work through it, again, pull some threat intelligence. Get some, in this case, we're going to pivot off of that, that same CISA report we, we discussed a little earlier. But in this case, we are really going to dig deep and show, as we start to scroll through here, uh, as an aside, the CISA reports are fantastic for this because they break down the actual TTPs, other tools, down to the atomic level uh, techniques that we need. And as you see here, this is where we're starting to, to pull these in. So I'll be sitting here with a text editor, this report and atomicredteam.io all up on my multiple screens and I'm just cutting and pasting into an emulation script. Through the major complexity is just the amount of tests. Again, very flexible. I can remove tests. I can add additional tests. I can do uh, multiple different tests for the same technique. Uh, I can even have just, just some text in there that says, hey, this is what we're doing here. This is what we're doing here. If you're a whiz with PowerShell, this is, you're going to feel right at home. And that complexity is really uh, how much you want to do versus any type of tool, very straightforward. So like anything, we're just going to go ahead and run using that Invoke Atomic and give it a second. One of the other things you can do here as well to really kind of stretch this is put in time delays, very simple PowerShell uh, command. And then we start to pivot into our detective mechanism, just like we did with Raspberry Robin. Now we're kind of pivoting into looking at an alert within our EDR. So, hey, we have something here that is indicative of an attack. So here we have that detection piece as we start to build in. We're going to start to dig a little bit deeper into what's happened. But as you can see, we're getting usable details that are like, this is what Akira would do, and this is what Akira might look like in you know, a WASA console. And what we may, that may be the single data point that we have that starts a, a, uh, a detection and response activity. So as we start to pivot into there, we can see we're already starting to pull little details out of here. So it could very well may be, in this case, an identity and access management issue that tricks us off. Somebody's been, uh, somebody's been trying to add a user account to an administrator group or an elevated privileges group. And then that's going to start our process. We also have now have a system name where we have to go to that system and address some of the security concerns. So what we do now is we have a detection. Our response process may be a complete evaluation of all the Windows event logs on that system. And in this case, what we're doing is walking through a workflow or playbook using an uh, artifact extractor like your CAPE or the, the curl artifact parser and extractor. So in this case, we're working through potentially that workflow that has us go to that system and extract a triage package that we are going to then evaluate with some additional tools. Pivoting back to that discussion that we had about usable evidence. And in this case, we're going from looking at extracting to now analyzing or, or normalizing our data so that we can actually see this in a timeline. And in this case, that's what we're doing. Again, hitting on that, don't think of this as just a, a validation tool, but now it's actually giving us usable evidence of what's actually happening. And in this case, we may have uh, some steps within our detection response process that says, hey, I want you to go through the sysmon logs looking for suspicious executions. And in this case, that's what we're doing here, using Timeline Explorer, digging through the results. Again, usable data, digging through those results to see if we can see anything outside of that detection. So as we start to dig through this, we're, see we're seeing 
all of that data, all of the stuff that normal Syspawn log entries, or in other cases, Windows security entries, and the actual malicious activity that we're conducting. So we're seeing more realistic of what a real analysis would look like as we start to see digging into the actual payloads of uh, these specific commands. We're seeing you know, net.exe or other commands of that post-exploitation that Akira conducts as part of its attack. The key takeaway from this overall threat is we're getting a lot of the same data that the threat actor would do, but it's mixed in with all of our others. So it's much more accurate, much more realistic of, of what actually would happen uh, in a scenario where we would have to find those malicious command executions alongside everything else. Again, it's all about how, how much you wanted to actually do. So a good construct to think about is an atomic drill. So here we would set up an emulation just as we did with Akira. Provide a detection or indication. So as, I, as we showed here, we got one. It was an identity and access management. Somebody attempting to add themselves to an administrator group. So I could pass that off my analyst and say, hey, what do you what do you think we should do with this? Given that we know maybe potentially a user account and the system, test their response actions. What are the plans and playbooks? Are they able to actually pivot off that and move into? And then this gives you a short 10 to 15 minute drill that you can conduct. Now think about it. If I if I ask you, do you have two weeks out of your, your month to do a full penetration test? aligned with Akira, you'd probably say, no, I just, we just don't have that time. But if I said 10 to 15 minutes each week, I give you a single test, a threat, or maybe a full emulation, and I give you 15 to 20 minutes to pivot off a of detection and start analyzing Sysmon logs or Windows security event logs, can you accomplish that? I think a lot of us could probably find that time. And what it's doing is, is training your personnel in that process as you work through it. So there is a, a uh, again, that flexibility of single technique all the way up to Akira. And you may do a single technique once a week, and maybe you're, you're pulling the latest ransomware group once a quarter and running an emulation plan to really identify, hey, these are the 20 to 30 TTPs we can emulate. This is what it looks like if we're doing a full analysis. So wrap it up and then I've got a few, you know, a few questions in the hopper here. This is a, an emulation tool that's cost effective. It, it really is, is free in terms of uh, free like a puppy. You do have some care and feeding uh, on your end to make it, make it effective. But at this point, it's really about how much time and how much uh, effort you can put to it. Start with a single technique, but think getting beyond that single technique. Uh, focus as you start to get better at more sophistication. But think about this as a, a visibility validation and training tool. So, got a few questions in the hopper here. Uh, does the emulation somehow give its emulation nature away? Yes, in a certain way it does. So what we're saying is, hey, does this actually look like a threat emulation? Yes, and it goes to complexity of the emulation script. The, the one drawback to emulating this is the activity happens rapid sequence. Now there are ways to set timers with PowerShell to run this test and maybe 10, 15 minutes run this test. Again, you can build that complexity in, but if you are running this, it's very easy. If you just see a whole bunch of executions happen within three minutes, uh, it does, does give itself away. Uh, some of the other emulations are very clear. Uh, sometimes if it's, for example, I believe it's run DLL 32, there's a proxy execution. And instead of it executing malware, it executes calculator because we don't want you, we don't want to download real malware. And GitHub gets a little upset if you're hosting malware. Uh, so it will look that way, but you can treat, you can treat as part of the exercise to say, hey, if you see calculator or calc.exe run, assume that's malicious. So there are ways to, to actually um, overcome those. But again, it's, it's emulating and not really um, a live, live 
breathing uh, threat actor on, on the onset there. Uh, have you run into issues testing your EDR, EDR tools uh, where your script has multiple tests to run, but the EDR tool kills the PowerShell script before all the tests run? If so, any suggestions on how you typically handle it? Uh, I will say a lot of a lot of uh, well-known EDRs will eat a lot of Atomic Red Team, uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, one of the things you can do is if you have an EDR tool that you can put into a monitor only, uh, always good to, that's a really good way to validate. Another way to do this is actually with a testing system, there is a way to disable Microsoft Defender for endpoint, you know, using GPO settings or just turning it off. Uh, th that is the easiest way to, to look at it. If that's really, if you're into that response, uh, you very well may, I have not seen it where it eats the entire script. It'll stop uh, specific tests though. Uh, MDE, for example, will just basically say, hey, I, I see you're trying to download Mimikatz or you're trying to use this tool dropping into this directory. Uh, my, there's uh, this kind of outside the scope of ransomware, but in terms of validation, there's two ways to do this. You can run two systems that are identically, you know, your stock gold image, one with your EDR stack on there and one without and test the same test on both ends to see what actually uh, your EDR is catching versus what you wouldn't catch with, um, say, Microsoft Defender for endpoint turned off, uh, which is also, you know, kind of if you're evaluating specific solutions too, is a way to kind of give you a control and a testing group. Um, another question, I support small businesses and we have pretty good systems in place, EDR tool, endpoint management, next gen firewall. Assuming all my empires are staying patched in a year, what benefits could I still gain when using ART? Uh, that's a really good question. We have all this security stuff. Well, uh, a lot of Atomic Red Team is living off the land binaries. And you have all of these security controls in place. That's awesome. Kind of layered defense. But let's kind of bypass validation. You know, we have a detection validation, let's say. Let's look at post-exploitation from uh, living off the land binaries. What's actually used to do a recon? And this is a really good thing to see from a logging perspective, what it looks like when a threat actor drops on a system, runs whoami.exe, maybe runs uh, NT commands or uh, networking commands, all of those living off the land binaries, run DLL 32 to run something of that nature. Um, it's a solid question, but there is value in understanding and visibility into what threat actor behavior using legitimate tools looks like. Um, one of the other things to, to think about as, as well as if they bypass EDR and able to run some specific things, would you be able to you know, extrapolate that out through uh, evidence sources outside of logs, for example? So there is still benefit, especially if you want to start testing some of those response plans and playbooks as well. Um, do I need to do this in isolated systems? They're not intrusive. Uh, the best way I would say, obviously you don't want to do this in a production environment uh, unless you really want to um, have, a, have an issue. Uh, they're not intrusive. They will drop specific tests. Mimi cats I keep bringing up, but there are tests that will drop uh, dual purpose tools. Uh, what I would say is have a dedicated testing box. I like virtual uh, because I can always just blow it up if I have to or revert to a good snapshot. I'll also run multiple. I'll have MDE enabled on one, as I said, and MD, MDE disabled on another to test scripts. Uh, and then very easily, whatever agent you're using. In this case, for those demos, I had the Splunk Universal Forwarder on one box. I had uh, the Waza um, agent on another, and that's all I did. Uh, you don't necessarily have to give it any specific network connectivity if you just want to have a one-to-one -one firewall rule to your detection mechanism. They're not necessarily... Um, uh, intrusive, but you definitely want to take care in setting this up in a production environment. Uh, if your organization, I worked in, in a few organizations where, you know, we had the ability off network to test specific things, another good thing. 
uh, to look at. Um, there's a lot of different, again, the flexibility is there. You can do this with a system with your agent installed or not. You can have a different agent for each system to compare and contrast what you can actually see. Um, cloud setup, want to emulate, uh, so how can we test this against cloud setup? Want to emulate it from external user point of view, kind of a black box test. I know there's some cloud um, cloud uh, test, but I think this is more like uh, an external um, uh, user. So think about all we're doing, you, know, you can run these tests on, on really any Windows, there's some Linux tests. Uh, on any system, anywhere. Um, again, it goes back to that flexibility of pulling in agents, maybe pulling in um, data through any source of telemetry that you can get to, to validate that. Does the Atomic Red team get updated with the latest attack techniques? Yeah, this is, is uh, there's a, a large community. There's even, a, a, I believe there's the Slack, uh, Slack group uh, where people continuously submit. Uh, so it really is a, a community-driven project with a lot of, of, of fantastic contributors that, that really make, make it a, a useful tool. So it is updated uh, when you do install. Um, when you do install things, um, you know, you get, get your Invoke Atomic installed. It's always a good idea if it's been a while to go down and, and use the uh, uh, get Atomics uh, parameter to, to pull down any new tests. Uh, you can see all of everything is is, is completely uh, visible on GitHub as well. And as we said, uh, so one of the final questions before we wrap up, unless anybody has anything else, uh, are t tests benign in nature or do they contain real samples? Yes, uh, there are benign tests. There are tests, as I said, that mimic Threat actor behavior like run DLL will execute calculator as opposed to malicious, uh, but there are other uh, other tests such as using PowerShell to download Mimi cats and then run Mimi cats on the endpoint. That is, uh, yes, that's a, a, a testing tool, but oftentimes uh, can be considered malicious code as well. Uh, I think we we've gotten all the questions out. Um, what do we do about Mac OS? I do believe there's a few Mac OS uh, tests out there. Um, you consult the the uh, the uh, the GitHub for for those, and and Atomic uh, Atomic Red Team .io has has all the information on all tests. Uh, a lot of good information there. Um, again, same same kind of construct. It's just a matter of how you're using and what you're using for for uh, testing. Okay, we've got a comment, not much. We've turned this into an appliance and integrated into my RC, RC portal. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. I'll, I'll take that back to the leadership. So, uh, Tests for Azure environments. Uh, I'm not sp specific for any type of uh, testing for, um, I believe, if I'm thinking back to like Azure CLI and, and some of that, you're looking more for um, uh, maybe service principal misuse or credential misuse. Uh, what I will say though, is think about um, even just, just uh, Azure infrastructure. If you're setting up servers or you're setting up uh, other types of services within Azure, these tests still, still can apply, especially when you're talking about you know, potential credential misuse. Uh, if you're looking at something where you're logging into Sentinel, it's a really good uh, KQL is sometimes uh, a lot more robust. So um, um, a lot more robust in terms of, of logging, uh, but I would say some of these are really good to run inside any systems in Azure because you're, you're going to be pulling a lot of those defender logs in through Sentinel. Uh, so it's always, this is a really good tool for really getting visibility on what happens on an endpoint, but those logs and detections are coming through into say Sentinel and what, what do you have for uh, both queries and, and what you have for playbooks and, and automated actions. 
Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Adam, uh, who's going to who close this out. Uh, please feel free to reach out with with any other questions. Uh, and and again, thank you very much for your time. And, and I really hope this was useful.